I'm gonna climb a tree. Watch out. Ah! Hi there. Welcome to another Forbidden Limb podcast. I'm your host, Richard New, and I'm here as always with Brian Hink and Jeremy Command. Hello. Uh, this week we're going to be discussing getting buzz started on your game, and we're going to talk about getting buzz started on your prototypes. So I'm going to start with you, Jeremy. Uh, can you tell us, first of all, why would I want to get buzz started on my prototype? Sure. You may take your, your prototype to some sort of con or event where they have a prototype room or a prototype testing zone, and maybe they don't have a speed date. So there's not a way to put yourself directly in front of a publisher with that prototype. And so if there's buzz and people are playing about it or talking about it, then that may give you a better chance of getting to a publisher. So let's say Brian plays my prototype at this con, because he knows me, he met me from the last one, and he goes, oh, you know what, I, I sold the game to so-and-so games, and this game would be a good fit for them. I may go tell them about that when I, I check in and talk to them at their booth or if I see them walking around the show. And so if, if people are aware of it, then they give me a referral or get me to a publisher who's an interested party. Or if I intend to self-kickstart it. A lot of games I see that are self-kickstarted, they do go to a lot of these prototype events or zones, even with a, a pretty much done game. And they're just polishing it or they're testing an expansion. They're like, oh yeah, we're going to put it on Kickstarter at this date. And I've even seen uh, prototypes do this where they have a sign-up sheet right next to the prototype for get, get notified about the Kickstarter. And they start building their mailing lists at prototype events, building the buzz for their prototype. So by the time they do launch on Kickstarter, they have this huge list of people they can email out to kick off the game. And then one thing I'll add to that too, um, so that, that list is, that's a great idea for, for building a Kickstarter campaign. I thought about doing it, I've never done it, but um, especially if you don't have that crowd, um, building that list is a way to build that crowd um, while while playtesting your game and making your game better. Um, and then, like, if you can get 500 names or email addresses of people who have played your game, then you launch the Kickstarter, send an email out to them, and now you just have 500 potential backers. Um, and that's huge if you don't have a huge, you know, social media influence or um, just influence within the industry. Um, another thing I want to say too is that the industry is small. So um, if I like, I hear about prototypes that are being played, and, and and other publishers too. You know, more established publishers, they they also hear about it. Um, they'll hear about it on podcasts from word of mouth. I mean, publishers talk between each other, and you know, publishers and designers talk all the time. So um, you know, if if a good if I see a game that doesn't fit my you know my brand. Uh, then I'll definitely tell any any brand if it's a, if I feel like it's a really good game, then I'll I'll recommend it to other publishers too. Because you know what those pro publishers might be into. Yeah. Okay, so yep. I'm hearing sort of two different answers here. Uh, you might be going the the publisher route, in which case you want uh, you want to turn people into your advertisers. Yep. Uh, and the other, you're going the Kickstarter route, in which you're turning the people into your publishers. Your well, your backers, your uh, you know financial backers for sure. publishing it yourself. Okay, um, how would you go about uh, getting people to play test your game at you know sure. to, the, your prototype game? So I'll, I'll use an example I thought was very clear. Brian Handy did a Paco game. Oh hi, this is Richard from the future. What Jeremy meant to say there was Chris Handy. Uh, please follow him on Twitter at uh, at Chris Handy, and uh, we'll go right back to the podcast. We do these games that are like a little bigger than like like a pack of like. Large bubble gum. Oh yes, I remember those. those yeah, you remember those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you played this too, and so he brought it to Unpub Pro to spill San Jose, and he was he's showing several of these little tiny games that, that all come together in a, in a big package, and you'd have like, these little pocket-sized games, and you'd do the collection of them, like a mini game library that Level Ninety Nine did, doing the same kind of idea, uh, and he had people to play them, and they liked this one or that one. He goes, "Oh, I'll tell you what, sign up on my little mailing list here, and I'll, I'll email you when the Kickstarter goes live." And then he got some other game designers to do some remote playtesting for him. So Candy Weber got a package of the Paco games, and she took it to some other game events and had people test it. And Brian was smart enough to give her a, a sign-up sheet as well. And so she was collecting emails for him. And so when he went live on Kickstarter, he already had a huge crowd of people to reach out for that had played the various prototypes, and he built up that buzz. So I'll add to that too. So um, you can also get reserve like a table at a convention too, where you can play your prototype, get people to play. Um, there are sometimes at a bigger con like Gen Con has a uh, what do they call that? A playtesters hall or something like that. Yeah, the double exposure, first exposure, play first exposure, play hall. I've, play I've done that. Yeah. I've paid to go to that one and I've done that one and that was useful. 
Uh, that one was a little expensive, but yeah. it was very. They they the benefit they have is they have a big staff, and so if you do that, you could say, oh, I, I only want to test this game with female players, or I want half male, half female, or I only want people over thirty, and they can like get you the demographics you want to test your game with, which is very impressive. This is just wandering people wandering by. Uh, I've done the Unpub Protozone at BGG twice, and you do that through Unpub, and then you get a you, you get a table that reserves slots for our blocks to reserve a table and do it at BGG, and that was pretty successful this year. They were right next to the game library. So do you feel like you had a good uh, supply of playtesters coming by? It, it was a little light. People were at BGG to play released games, okay. and not unreleased games. So it, it was... Yeah, I was wondering about that. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I've been to gaming conventions before, but they tend to be more of the, um, the Gen Con variety. Uh, and so uh, you, you go there, you, you want to see the games that are ready to go, um, and I've done a lot of playtesting with you and with you as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, I could just see going to those and being like, eh, I don't really want to do one of the unfinished, you know, something that isn't polished and ready to, you know, yep. I can't buy. Yes. After I'm finished playing it, oh, can I get it now? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> get on the <laughs> list. That, uh, <laughs> yeah. And you can give me money to make it, and then I'll eventually get it. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I could see it being pretty hard to. Would you recommend? More of the protospiel or the unpub events. Yeah, because those are focused to... on. Yeah, you, you'll definitely be more productive at a protospiel or unpub event than you will in a prototype zone in a major con. I was pretty productive at Gen Con. Gen Con, you bought a fixed amount of two-hour blocks, and they guaranteed you'd fill your seats. So if you had a six-player game, they guaranteed they'd get you six players. Okay. Uh, and so that that they, that worked. But other cons where I've done like a prototype zone. It can be it can be fairly dead for long periods of time. So what we do is you get the other designers and you take turns playing each other's games, and that, that works. Do you remember the cost of Gen Con? I because I I, I, I looked at it. It was two fifty. It was two fifty like four hours. I think it was two two hour blocks. I think it was either four or six hours. Okay. Yeah, and and so versus like a uh, Anna Michigan Pro Spiel for three days, I paid a hundred bucks. Uh, when I went to uh, Pro Spiel Houston. And you were open the entire three days to have... Yeah, so as long, okay. many times I get my the game to the table, I can do it. Okay. Uh, at Pro Spiel Houston, I think it was 60 bucks. And again, as many times as I get my games to the table, I, I could do it. Do you feel like the cost was worth it then to have uh, a small... You said it was two four-hour windows, is that... What At Gen Con? Two, two hours, or maybe okay. it was three, And then there was two three two-hour two blocks. It was, it was and they wound up having hours. some weird times that no one wanted, like, you know, 10 p.m. to midnight. Mm -hmm. And so I think I got a fourth block for free because no one wanted that weird <laughs> yeah. block time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was worth doing once, or if you need to test uh, with a, a specific demographic, let's say I can't get, you know, kids to test my game locally or something like that, they'll get you a specific demographic. And Gen Con's a big show, so it's a good way to build buzz. Uh, I had publishers come to my slots to play some of my games. So they had heard about a game, and they're interested in it, or I went to the booth and I talked to them, I gave them my sales sheet, and I said, by the way, I'll be doing it in the first exposure playtest hall at this time. And I actually had a couple publishers come play at those times, or just stop by and observe, because they wanted to see it and check it out. Yeah. Okay. And it, I, so I seriously considered it, but it was too expensive for me. I just didn't see the return on investment. Yeah. Um, especially because you know here in the Bay Area we have uh, you know a great playtesting community. I have that back in Minnesota too, back in Minneapolis. So um, I don't really have a shortage of playtesters. So it wasn't that as valuable to me as like my design partner Clayton is out in South Dakota. And he has a hard time finding people to play his mm -hmm. game. So for him, or, or someone who doesn't have that great playtesting network developed, then they can go to a place like Gen Con or another convention, and um, and they can pay for that. But for me, it was just a little too expensive. I think I think Pro Spiel and Unpub are absolutely worth it. I'm going to go to Pro Spiel Houston again this year. I'm going to go to Unpub 5. Uh, would I do the, the the one at Gen Con again, the more expensive one? That would be iffy. I'd say I'd say probably not, but I could see myself doing that again with a certain kind of game that would, would fit well there, or I wanted to test with a certain demographic. Since we're talking about buzz, then is there one that's better for a different type of buzz? Like we sort of delineated the two different types. Um, is one better for getting the Kickstarter and one better for uh, getting a publisher? Oh I mean, yeah, absolutely. At BGG or, or Gen Con, that's getting a publisher. Okay. Uh, Protospiel or Unpub, that's 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 Kickstarter. Uh, uh, there's publishers at those events too, uh, but they're smaller and there's you know a few publishers there. Like mostly Houston, there was two or three publishers there, and that's fine. I wasn't going there to talk to publishers. I was going there to get other designers to play my game and give me re really good feedback to develop the game. You know, it's it's an acid test. 
uh, to the game to help it, help it level up and really really stress test it. Uh, and so the, the, a trade show, then you'll be more publisher focused. Unpublished first spiel, you can, there'll be a few publishers there. Like at Unpublished San Jose, we had four or five publishers show up. But you know, Gen Con, there's 50 publishers there. There's a okay. lot more. So that's, that's the difference. And there's a lot of overlap there too. So yeah. you know, even if you go to one, you're still getting, you know, you're still getting, uh, you're building up a, a network and some buzz for, you know, either a Kickstarter or a publisher. Um, and I think if you build up one, you know, it's much easier to get the other one too. Okay. Uh, so how do I get? I've gotten, you know, the people interested in my game. How do I get the publishers to play my game? Now that I've got, you know, I'll give you another goes. example, please. Uh, so SaltCon in uh, Utah. They have this thing called the Ion Award, and the uh, deadline to enter is every January 1st each year. And what you can do is you can submit their pro your prototype to this contest, and then it may get nominated for a top prize or it may win the prize. I think uh, Eggs and Empires won mm -hmm. last year, and that got a whole bunch of buzz going into its Kickstarter campaign. And then it won Geek Dad's Game of the Year and got even more mm -hmm. buzz mm -hmm. rolling out. And so you can look for these kind of contests. So the ones I'd say is uh, the, the Ion Award from SaltCon, there's the table tap death match that the Cards Against Humanity guys do. Okay. They've been doing that just before Gen, a few months before Gen Con each year. They've done it twice. They'll probably do it again this year. And you can enter that. If you make one of like the top 16 finalists there, uh, even if you don't win, that's that's a big deal. Or I think maybe it was top 32 last year because now your your game from like 500 made top 32. That's good buzz for your game. And so your pu publisher may go, oh, I only made the top cut there. So that there's must be something there. Uh, Tabletop Best Match is very theme heavy and not game mechanics heavy. Or Eye in the Ward, they really want to play the game and look at the mechanics war, uh, more. Uh, and then uh, PAX. PAX is now starting an indie board game showcase. And you can enter to be in the PAX indie showcase. Uh, that may be another way of building. So if I got selected from all the applicants, I can say, oh, I got accepted to PAX. I was, you know, nominated for the Ion Award, or I got accepted there. I made it to the top 16 table, table of deathmatch. If I did, if I made any of those, then that's very rewarding for the publisher because, oh, look, hmm, there's something there because this game is getting attention from screening processes. Someone else has screened this game and it's made the cut. Yeah, and something like the tabletop deathmatch. I know some of those games have come on as Kickstarter projects. Yes, you know, a whole bunch, a whole yeah. bunch. Yeah, yeah. Because that that really is enough of a crowd or enough of enough buzz to really just you know get your campaign off to a good start. As long as you kind of know what you're doing with the Kickstarter campaign, um, that's that's enough of a base to get that funded. I know Outer Earth was one yeah. uh, that I saw. I think like American Idol, right? A bunch of people make the top ten in American Idol, and they don't you know win. But then they get a record deal and they put it out well, uh, and they have some sort of music career. Uh, and so I will take your word on that. <laughs> 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 but that just getting to that, that that the upper level is a big deal. This year for Unprob uh, Pro Spiel Sound and Say, I want to do awards. Uh, we did a design contest and awarded a, an award for the game design on site. But I want to award games, uh, do awards for prototypes, like best yeah. family game best strategy game, best light game, kind of like how film festivals work. You go mm -hmm. to a film festival, getting accepted is, is a big deal because they screen it there. Then if you win a jury prize or an audience award or something, you can put that on your advertising or your sales sheet for your movie. And I'd love to do the same thing for board games. And so I want to bring that to Pro Spiel Info events where you can get this little award if you were the best strategy game at that event because then you can say, hey, look, against these all of these other guys, I, I stood out from the crowd. My game is something special. In the case of Unpub, Unpub has on their prototype uh, form ratings, player ratings. So players rate the thematic content, how fun it was, the play time, all that kind of stuff. And so I saw on some of the sales sheets in speed dating at DGG this year, people were putting their Unpub ratings. So like one guy had an average rating of like uh, 4.2 to 4.5 out of 5 in all categories. And out of, you know, like, you know, 30 free book forms like that. So that's that's pretty good. You can say, hey, look, my game got good grades yeah. from all yeah. these all these playtesters, and that's a good way to just build some buzz for that too. Because then if I'm a publisher coming by and look at that sheet, like, oh well, people clearly like this game. Now, a wide variety of people like this game. Let's get that game off to Harper. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, and, and there are there are some smaller groups, smaller conventions. You know, we we have, we have a few in the Bay Area too that are pretty small. 
Um, but if you were to, you know, create like a reward system for that, I mean, anything, you know, as a if if I were a designer trying to get some notice for my game, um, any kind of award that I could put on an even an email to a publisher to try to get a meeting, you know, at a convention to show it to them or something, anything um, that that would set you apart, you know, I think would go a long way. You know, get, I your, get your game a resume. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. exactly. You now, are kind of doing what if, what applies to you or? Excuse me. What appeals to you as uh, a, a publisher? What is it? Uh, is it when you hear the buzz? Mm -hmm. When you how how many people would it have to be before you start going? Mm, maybe I should look at this thing. I mean, buzz buzz is kind of it's it's um it's hard to to pinpoint how useful it is, but any kind of buzz is good. The thing is, what I've seen, I guess, is that buzz goes away. You know, so if if yes. if a prototype yeah. um, gets a lot of buzz, you know, then maybe I sign it, and I'm going to spend a few months developing it. Um, and then I'll put it on Kickstarter, and then the Kickstarter will, you know, you know, uh, will go through, um, and then we'll fulfill it, and eventually, you know, it's going to get out to everybody into distribution. But um, there's a, each time, every time you have a period where there the, there is no buzz for it. So like um, in between the end of a campaign and when it actually gets fulfilled, there's a little bit of a gap here where p people forget about it. And um, what happens is you. As soon as now it hits distribution, you kind of have to start over with the buzz. So it, it's, you know, buzz is great, um, but I guess I look at it more as if it's getting buzz, this is probably a good game. Um, and if if the buzz actually carries over into like a Kickstarter campaign, that's a bonus. But I'm going to kind of assume that I'm going to have to start over because it's going to take a long time before I'm actually ready to put it out there. So that's how I look at it. So but is that I, not necessarily the first thing you look at for no, deciding it's, it's how good this game is and whether it fits our brand? That's more important. I, I'm. Yeah, so let me ask you, uh, in terms of deciding what to play, because you can't play every game. Oh, right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is is that one of the main things you would look at you know, in order to play? Honest, a game? I, I'll be honest, it's not. It's it's um, whether the designer has been established, you know, and I recognize that name. Um, but then. Both uh, helps you there. It does. It does. Yeah, Buzz can Buzz can help build up that reputation too as a designer. But if you have a published game already and it's been successful, um, that's gonna that's that's number one for me really. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm looking at a game, um, but well, for people trying to get in there into the field, you know, mm -hmm. you can't start having already published something. You have to start having it's not really published hard. anything. And that's where we have to go back to that resume. Um, and you do have to build it up because um, once you're an established designer, once you've been published. Um, especially if it's successful, you know, you open so many doors. But um, until then, you have to build up that, that you have to give me a reason for me to play it and to meet with you because most publishers out there don't have time to play all the games that, you know, people ask them to play. You know, they'll get emails all the time. Look, That's very true. Game, will you play my game? You have to find a way to get some time with them, like at a convention or something, mm -hmm. to sit down um, and play a game with you. You have to schedule a meeting at a convention, really. You mentioned good fit for your brand. So this is a big deal mm -hmm. that many publishers are specialized, and they, you know, mm -hmm. they may play a game that they they like, but it's not a good fit for your, their brand. But if your game has built up some buzz, they may refer you to yeah. a publisher. Who does like that? So I mean, so pass the paint. This is how I signed pass the paint. I had showed it to John Goodenough of AEG, and John had played it and he liked it. He said, "I like this game. This is a good game. I really like this game. It's not a good fit for AEG. You should go talk to these two or three game companies. That it's a good fit for their brand." And I did, and one of them picked it up. And because of that referral, because of that buzz, he'd been aware of it. He had seen it at a speed date. He'd, he'd seen it at a prototype event. He had then asked for a copy and played it. It's like, oh, you should go take it to these guys. And I've seen that work in many other cases, too, where a game will get referred into someone. Like, oh, so the publishers I know, I'm looking for something that may fit their brand. Uh, so like Randy of Foxtrot goes, I want like a high-end family game. So it's, it's a family could play it, but it's good for gamers, too. It's kind of a high-end family. It's not a simple game. And so when I see a game like that, I may email Randy, hey, Randy, I played this prototype game called Blah 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 with so-and-so. Here's their content. I thought it was good. You may want to take a look at it. And in some cases, he will. He'll ask for the sell sheet or ask for a project copy, and then he'll, he'll look at it and go, oh, you know, this might fit for our brand. And because I played that game and built some buzz for that and did that referral, that game might get signed or might get picked up for, for that reason. And, and this actually goes back to the, this is really a small world. The, the gaming industry, the tabletop gaming industry, that's really a small world. And you know, I'll refer all the time. If I if I play a game that I like, you know, I'll refer people to another publisher, and I'll I'll even reach out to the publisher myself sometimes, and say, hey, do you? This is a good game, and here's why it's good, and um, here's why I think you should spend some time at least considering it, and possibly taking a look at it. So that that happens all the time in in this industry. 
Now, it sounds like you guys work also to create buzz for the games that you like. Yeah, is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I want to I build relationships with uh, other designers and other publishers because we can do this. And I want a publisher to say, hey, check out this hidden identity game that I think would really fit your brand. And I want to get that. You know, if they'll tell me that they think this game is good, you know, I want to build those relationships with them and I will return the favor too. And then with designers too, I want people to come to me with their game because, you know, I want to support them and I want to help them as much as I can. And I want them to come back to me when they have a game that might fit my brand. Right, that sounds like what it would eventually lead to is your the the you know the more that you give out uh, to, to the community, the more it's going to circle back and go. This is a guy that I can keep going to, and you know, sure. eventually you're going to find something that does fit your brand. Yep. Uh, so it sounds like as a publisher, as a game designer, that's what you want to do. You want to keep yep. uh, not just looking at your own game, but you want to be sharing and. and Definitely. You know, growing other people's gardens a little bit too. And I'll tell them what I'm looking for at the moment too. This is the type of game that I want to publish right now. And then hopefully they maybe have something, they know of something, or they create something from scratch and, and something, you know, that, that I'm looking for. So, so like for John, for me, G, I feel I owe him a favor because he gave me a good yeah. referral that worked out. And so I will be looking for things that would be a good fit for him to be his eyes and ears to try to return the favor. And say, hey, I just played this. It would be what you, were, you told me you were kind of the thing you were looking for. You should take a look at that. Because I would love to kind of pay him back. All right, sounds great. Uh, I want to thank you guys for joining me here today. Uh, today we've been talking about how to get buzz for your prototype game. Uh, you can uh, contact us with any issues you'd like to talk about at uh, theforbiddenlim.com and at the theforbiddenlim at gmail.com. Uh, uh, sorry, the website. Yeah, oh, I'm right. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my bad, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> the yeah. Forbidden Land Gmail or the Forbidden Land account. They both <laughs> work. And I, I would say that if you hear of another game design contest and would like to refer us to it, I'd love to hear. So I know about the Tabletop Deathmatch and the Salkan Iron Award and anything else out there that you think is a, a game design contest that other designers should know about, please drop us a line and let us know about that. Maybe you're running one of these contests, and then we'd love to mention it on the show. We'll definitely mention that in an upcoming episode, too. All right. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I've been your host, Richard New. I'm here with Brian Hink and Jeremy Commander. Uh, until next time, uh, I hope to see you guys across the table.